Welcome to Fraternity Foodie, everybody. My name is Mike Eilon with Greek University, and welcome to the fifth installment of our program. We're rolling right along, and as always, we are going to tackle the really, really difficult conversations in these interviews, and we're also going to get the inside scoop on what our guests like to eat and where we can go to get it, so stay tuned for that. Today, we have with us Kali Richardson. Kali is a inspirational millennial speaker. He's a motivator. He's a consultant and a new voice in our industry. So I wanted to make sure that all of our listeners get a chance to hear a little bit more about what he's doing and what he's focusing on. So welcome, Kali, to the program. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Hey, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much for being here. So uh, I know that originally you were at the U.S. Virgin Islands, and then you ended up moving to Florida. What age did you move? Uh, make that move from the U.S. Virgin Islands? Well, growing up as a kid, I was back and forth a lot in general. Okay. Um, but I came stateside and stayed stateside in about 2010. I actually got recruited for the national team. So it forced me to come stateside, be here for a while. And after that, I shortly later, went off to college. Okay, that's excellent. So you growing up in the U.S. Virgin Islands, how does that shape you as a person? And how is that different than what you're experiencing here stateside? Uh, I think it definitely played a very major role in how it shaped as a person. And that's only because there's a lot of things here in America that people take for granted that we don't have, like AC or hot water, um, DSL. Uh, we started to get, you know, a little bit more with the times. But when I was growing up, those are things that were commodities. So when I come here and I work with a lot of students and target populations that I focus on, a lot of their complaints that I hear about their circumstance to me personally, isn't that bad. I'm like, well, worst case scenario, you have federal systems to help you. We don't. Um, so I think it definitely made me a little bit more aware of how bad things can really be, but also gave me a little bit more of a unique worldview instead of just a typical millennial in America. Yeah, that's a great perspective to have. I know that you're currently working on completing your master's degree in public health. You're over at the University of West Florida. So what made you choose that particular major and why the University of West Florida? Uh, well, I actually did my bachelor's degree at the University of West Florida. I transferred from Bryan College in Dane, Tennessee after my first year, finished up at West Florida, and I actually got into UCF. Um, I'm here in Orlando now. Got you guys in UCF, and I was talking to some of the faculty, te faculty and staff at UWF just because we have that kind of relationship. And they were like, yo, if you wanted to go to grad school, why didn't you just tell us? <laughs> and they basically, you know, pulled some strings, made some phone calls, and next thing I knew, I was a student again. And I was like, hey, I'm not going to ask any questions. You know, they took care of me when I was undergrad. They take care of me now. I'm very appreciative of them. And so I ended up being there. Public health uh, kind of came out to be because I wanted to do physical therapy. And as everyone knows who's pursuing physical therapy, you apply two, three, four, five times and don't get in. That's a common thing. And so after my second time not getting in, I was like, I can't sit around another year not doing anything. So I tried to, you know, diversify my portfolio in the medical field, getting an MPH is like getting an MBA. Um, and so I actually graduated in May. I'm just trying to, you know, take those next steps and hopefully be doctor rich sometime soon. Very nice. Well, congratulations on uh, completing that. That's excellent. And I know a few years ago, back in 2015, you also started Alchemic Solutions. And it sounds like the goal there was to connect professionals and millennials with various services that they might need. So what types of services typically are you giving for these new professionals and millennials? Primarily, it's between consulting and workshops. Um, the numbers say basically that in about 2020, 2021, that 70% of the workforce will be millennials. But the problem is that there's too many millennials graduating and not enough mentors or people investing in them for them to do the accurate and quality job that they acquire of us. So for example, one of the guys that I'm actually under for my internship this spring, he probably has 20, 22 years on me, but he graduates in April and I graduate in May with the same degree, mm -hmm. doing the same practice. And so, and I told him something that's important for me as money is that I want to learn from your experience because that's one thing I don't have. And most millennials don't have that issue. So I try to connect them with other professionals who want to want to be mentors. And two, they don't have some of the basic skills they picked up in college because some of them do dual enrollment. Some of them graduate super early. They don't have any of what we call soft leadership skills, like knowing what a SWOT analysis is or Robert's rules, things like that. Mm -hmm. I love that you're doing that. And you're so right, because when I was growing up and I, when I was in college, I definitely had mentors in my life. 
I had family friends who were successful that I knew I could call them if I had any questions while I was up at college, um, questions about majors or whatever. Um, and then joining the fraternity also, you end up finding other mentors within the fraternity, people who are older than you, people who are advisors, et cetera. Um, so there were always people in my life that were older and more experienced than I was that I felt comfortable going to with questions. But today, when I'm speaking on college campuses, one of the things that I see over and over again is those mentors, they're not there for today's college student. I just don't see them enough. Um, and so that's, that's troublesome, I think, for college students because many times I see that when they're asking for advice, they're asking another college student that's the same age as them for advice on something. And usually it doesn't turn out very well. And also a lot of these chapter meetings that I go to for fraternities and sororities, typically there's no advisor in the room for some of these meetings. And I'm saying to myself, what a missed opportunity if we could somehow connect either a professor or an advisor or somebody to sit in at, at a minimum in the weekly meetings, that would have so much positive impact for the chapter and for the students that are there. Um, so I love that you're doing that connection for them. It's so needed. I agree. If, if I may, um, as a fraternity man myself, I completely understand. Even though I'm recently graduated, I'm also co-advised the chapter of my fraternity here at UCF. And I tell them all the time, there's two parts to that problem. Problem one is willing to listen from the undergraduate perspective. And two, and I kind of pick on the university a little bit, is having qual quality staff. And I don't mean people who are just on paper qualified, but those overachievers, those leaders, that will go above and beyond because as a student, if the faculty staff at my university at the time, for example, Dr. Brian Turner, now Dr. Jeff Benjamin, and a couple other uh, men on my campus didn't be at the events that I go to or pull me aside or do the, the extra umph, I can't guarantee you I'd be the same man I am today. Right. I completely agree. And I'm glad that they were there for you. Um, and I'm glad that I had those mentors as well because I feel indebted to them as well. You're obviously trying to bring a certain amount of change to communities, and I think you're going through minorities, I think you're going through young professionals, you're going through millennials. So, you know, if you can explain to us, what type of change are you really looking for in today's millennials, college campuses, et cetera? Uh, the biggest thing I really want to impact is quality over quantity. Because there's so many of us coming out, and in multiple arenas that I kind of move around in, I see it all the time. I remember one of my first alumni chapter meetings here in Orlando. I called some guys that I know that are like, hey, you guys, come with me to this meeting. And while we're there, I'm counting heads and counting heads. And I tell them, I say, yo, we need literally one vote to control one of the two strongest chapters in all of Florida. And we're all under 35. So, I'm, so understanding that if we just work together and we actually increase our quality, we can produce better products, better services that in turn will create a better world. But if we aren't investing those from multiple aspects, it's very difficult to create that change. Gotcha. Okay, very good. I know you recently spoke at Florida Gulf Coast University, and I noticed the topic right away because I'm a fraternity man, love fraternity. The topic was called Empower Our Letters. So what's the goal of that particular presentation? Uh, there were a couple of things. As it says, empower. So first and foremost, no offense to anybody who's a fraternity man, but I'm very proud of my organization and I tell them, and it's how I opened up, I love to know, hey, I'm probably the proudest life member of Alpha Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, the new beta chapter seat of the University of West Florida. And if your fraternity has a problem with that, come see me. And so in, in our council at MPHC, we have this uh, healthy competition kind of mentality. And it's just like, yo, if you do something good, I can do it better. And if we're both trying to help the community, our friendly quarrel in a sense, only betters it. Because if you're giving scholarships, I'm going to try to give more. And it just kind of creates that cycle. So, again, quality over quantity and, and telling them for us to fix the problem, as you know, Greek life is in a very dangerous diaspora right now when it comes to power struggle and politics and hazing, things like that, is one, we have to not only select quality members, but also we have to mentor, train, and develop those quality members. And so, in our fraternity, we say we develop leaders. We don't create you. We find those who are ready leaders and we make you stronger. And if we're constantly building on, on that, you're one piece of the machine. If you're doing good work on a local level, which does work on the state level and so on and so forth, up to the national level, the entire organization will be stronger. And if we're doing it the right way, right, by our national organization bylaws and credentials, you shouldn't be in the news in a more negative light. Right. Back in from 1905, 1906 till 
I want to say the 1970s, 1980s, and PhD was a very strong moving factor in a lot of civil rights movements. So understanding that background and culture is capable for any organization to do it if we just put out money and resources where I'm out there. Yeah. I love your focus on quality members. I love your focus on going out and recruiting existing leaders. I think that is lost today. Um, it just seems like, especially on the IFC, Panhellenic uh, area, it just seems, you know, where I do the bulk of my work, it just seems like we're just taking people that come to us. Um, and it's just a really lazy form of recruitment and we're not getting the best people. And so really, when we start talking about recruitment, I really try to shift to um, really, you know, what we would call dynamic recruitment, where we're recruiting year round, not just, you know, the first couple of weeks of each semester, and that we have a pipeline built of existing leaders on campus from existing clubs and organizations that are leaders. That's really our pool of people that we should be recruiting to our fraternities and sororities. Um, but that takes a little bit more work than convincing a freshman who just arrived on campus, right? Who's looking to connect socially that might want to be plugged into the social scene. And so people just end up taking that lazy form of saying, all right, we're just going to take the, you know, the people that are easy to recruit, you know, let's say first semester freshmen, they're kind of unproven. Um, they're looking to connect socially as opposed to maybe just going out and getting the leaders already on campus. And when we recruit leaders or people who have, you know, let's say military veterans, for example, um, people who might be a little bit older than the general population, but tons of leadership ability because they've led battalions, you know, in the army, whatever it is, yeah. um, they can certainly give a lot to our chapter. And are those particular students who are already leaders um, in their prior lives, are they going to go and sit in the back of the chapter meeting and not contribute? Absolutely not. They're going to want the chapter president's job because that's what they do. They lead. And, you know, so when I, when I hear chapters yep. complaining about the fact that we don't have any up and coming leaders, I'm saying, let's go back and let's look at your recruitment techniques, because obviously something is broken yeah. here. And, and let's look at it from, from this perspective. This is something I also told my FGC when we were talking to Power Letters. Um, the, the audience was IFC, CPC, Multicultural, and PHC, the whole nine. And something I was telling them is that if so, anything worth having is worth working for. And so... Even if that means, and I would kind of like to use things I've personally been involved with as examples, because I don't like to pick on anybody. I tell something that we did is that if a freshman came to talk to me and said, hey, I'm, I'm interested in your organization, first I'm going to ask him is a GPA. If the GPA is not over 3.0, I'm going to tell him right now, sir, we can't have a conversation. I need you to get your GPA over 3.0. I need you to be on the e-board of any organization that you, you know, hold deep in your heart. I need you to train. Take a year, do that. I'm not going anywhere. The chapter's not going anywhere. If you really are interested in the values and the morals and the aim and model of my fraternity, you won't go anywhere. Because I personally waited, what was it? Four weeks, three days, two, well, four weeks, three, yeah, four years, three weeks, two days, and about 23 minutes to change. Consistently putting forth effort, leadership roles, working my dynamics. And so if I can wait almost basically my whole college career to be a part of something that I believe in, so can you. Um, but also the dynamics between IFC, CPC, and other councils, as you know, are different when it comes to their recruitment and their numbers and things that they need. So I think we may need to look at it from a national organization perspective and figure out how to work between the lines of meeting both quotas and quality, which is often the, the hard part. Yeah, since we're talking about different councils, I have a question for you because I think I have a lot to learn from you. I think our audience has a lot to learn from you. Um, and my biggest question is within, let's say, IFC, Panhellenic, it just seems like most incoming students, new members, um, members that are there already, they just seem to be there for a four-year experience, okay? We're not keeping them once they graduate. Once they graduate, for the most part, they're gone. I mean, I love my fraternity. I'm doing work for my fraternity every day, and, and this is what I'm going to dedicate my life to. But I'm very unusual in that sense, to find somebody my age that is this involved in fraternity life. Um, but multicultural organizations, they seem to have it figured out. You know, they seem to have members for life. And so that's my question. You know, why is it that the multicultural organizations are able to do that? Whereas I don't see that at all within IFC and Panhellenic. Why is that? Well, so a little bit of history. So I think it kind of comes down to the structure, right? And the culture that was cultivated. So from my understanding of IFC, CPC, these organizations, when they were founded, they're more of uh, banding together at the time 
after they graduated college, there wasn't a need for an alumni presence because their network was their need. So as long as they can communicate and, and connect with their brothers and sisters, it wasn't much of a problem. Now, back in 1905, 1906, when Alpha was started, which was the framework for all the APAC and all the other multicultural organizations, something that happened is that after, they, their job was to just graduate. They were like, hey, we can get together and graduate. And then after we graduate, we said, okay, now that we graduated, we need to figure out how to fight the battle on the national level, which required alumni chapters. Um, our first alumni chapter was <clears throat> in Kentucky. And so what we did is that now it's a common thing to have anybody from, say, 20, 21 who's graduated, there to brothers who are 70, 80, 90 years old who still come to chapter meetings once a month, who still help the fraternity. And so what we do it on a college level, we basically do on a citywide level. So once you graduate, instead of me focusing on my college community, now here in Orlando, I target the Orlando population, everything from like Sanford to like Lakeland. And so we're trying to help those communities who need our help. And nothing's really changed. It's just we're not getting to hang out on campus and just take it anymore, you know, if you have jobs and families and things like that. And so for the IFC and CPC, I push us to try, try to change their alumni structure to support that kind of idea that, hey, you guys can compete with college chapters. That's what alumni chapters do. We compete against the college chapters in multiple arenas. And if not, we mentor and teach them at the same time and create kind of this uh, pipeline vacuum so that once you're initiated, you know, as soon as you graduate, you can join alumni chapter normally for your first year for free. You know, get your feet wet because it's a little bigger of a pool and gradually worry about the financial piece as you're learning how to deal with $100,000 budgets instead of $30,000, $40,000 budgets and things like that. So it's completely capable. I mean, I see CPC, they have the numbers. I think it's just a structural issue. We, gotta, we have to kind of evaluate and see what we can do to make that happen. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much for shedding light on that. And this is why I love these fraternity foodie interviews, because I feel like there's so much to learn from each other. If we just talk to each other and just share that information, we can help each other. You know, I think there are some things that we do well, some things that you guys are doing well. So why can't we just share information so that way we can help each other? It's just, it's, it's one group, you know, that's it. It's just one people. Yeah. It is. It's one of those things that we do on, um, on my campus. My campus is a predominantly white institution. And what we did is that we know that culturally, a lot of PWI, I'm sorry, a lot of uh, CPC and ISC organizations, they tend to do a lot of like one or two big event type of programs every year. While we program year round, like we're doing programs two, probably two times a month, three times a month, sometimes seven days a week, depending on what's going on. And so what we kind of did is that on those big events that they did, we supported their events participated in whatever it may be. And in turn, they came to work with our events. A lot of the uh, young ladies in the CPC actually do our scholarship, our scholarship bowl, excuse me, our dance competition, and other competitions we have social media wise, which gets them to incorporate and we all hang out and you know, do social stuff like do food and do game nights, stuff like that. We just try to incorporate and say, hey, we want you guys to come hang out with us and we're gonna come out and support you. And as long as we support each other, this Greek thing can work. This is how it works. We're stronger together than we right. are divided. 100% agreed. I, I wish I could somehow get that message on every college campus because that's so, so, so important. Um, I know you had a recent workshop that you did at Virginia Commonwealth University. It was called New College Success. So what tips and what strategies can you share for today's college students that relate to new college success? Basically, I take an athletic approach. So I tell them the best athletes or the, you know, the best athletes that make them good to great are the basics. And normally you have all these leaders, right? We're just kind of throw air tags on it right now, leaders. They're just in the position. They weren't groomed, they weren't taught, they were just put in a position because no one else wanted it or they want it for the resume builders. They didn't have no effort to put it in. And so they don't have the basic skills that we know as fraternity men to work with. Again, Robert's rules, how to run a meeting effectively, flawed analysis every quarter, financial planning, and a high quality leader. Okay, all right, good. Um, so tell us more about the Men of Color Initiative that you rolled down at the University of Wisconsin at Oshkosh. I've been to that campus before. Um, what is the Men of Color Initiative? What does that entail? Um, so Dr. Tony Lang basically came up with the Men of Color Initiative. It's similar to what we have at the University of West Florida called UWF Men, 
or a professional organization that I helped start called the Collegiate 100. And basically it's a profitable institution is statistically proven that men of color tend to graduate at far lower rates than their female counterparts and far lower rates than anybody else on the campus. So kind of creating like a social study group kind of atmosphere where either A, they can stay together, do social things together, and just create cohesiveness and camaraderie amongst the young men so that they have a reason to stay. Kind of like in high school, most young men go to school to play sports or to meet their friends. Grades are just a byproduct. So trying to take that, that idea of you're here for school now, which is a priority, but really put you around other guys who want the same thing that you want, and you all can accommodate and push each other to do so. And so when we went there, that's what we talked about is how can we work better together as a group? And that sometimes that means swallowing our pride. Sometimes that means being emotional and communicating. Sometimes that means that we have to work harder due to our circumstances and our locations for the things that we want. Even though it may not be the ideal situation, things can always be worse, but together we can always make them better. And so just as long as we hold, hold ourselves accountable, there's a better way, kind of like a brother system. If I go, you go. If we all start, we all finish. and kind of drag each other across the finish line. And so the goal of that program is, again, for them to just graduate, for them to have a higher base GPA across the campus and to affect that amongst the minority males across the campus overall. I love it. That's an incredible initiative. Um, that's really good. I, you know, I also, I want to talk about racism uh, a little bit. Um, certainly as, as somebody who is Jewish, uh, you know, I've seen within the last few years, certainly attacks on the Jewish community has increased significantly on college campuses. Um, and, you know, it's alarming uh, for me, uh, certainly. Uh, so when I look out and I see what's going on today, I'm alarmed about what I see. Um, so when we talk about millennials today that are on college campuses, what issues do you feel like millennials are facing when it comes to racism? Uh, I think today the issue, at least when I started school, the issue was stereotypes. And the issue was uh, almost like a culture issue. And so, for example, a lot of our black and minority organizations on campus weren't given the same invitations or attention as our white organizations. And from there, that'd be from a faculty staff perspective, from student activities, or from amongst each other. Like, of course, the campus will primarily support them, or they will kind of stay in their own bubble, and we stay in our own bubble. And so, the issue one is communicating just cross culturally and being competent in that, and you know, diversifying ourselves with other cultures. And normally, especially when it comes to our, our counterparts, they often feel uncomfortable in asking certain questions. So, I had a lot of friends who are IFC, CPC, that had great guys, um, great young ladies. And it wasn't until I kind of joined my organization that they were like, hey, I want to ask you some questions, but I don't want you to feel offended. I'm like, it's cool. If it's offensive, I'll let you know so you don't do it again. But <laughs> let's try to have that awkward conversation and navigate. Because I'd rather you be educated about my culture as a Black Island man or as a Black Greek and know what's going on instead of being oblivious and allowing your ignorance to rule your thoughts. And so today is... If you're in a diverse arena, you may get subtle hints, body language, lady grabbing her purse in the elevator, stuff like that. Um, but if you're in other areas, I remember we did a march um, at an MLK memorial in Pensacola, Florida one time, and a guy showed up, full camo, head to toe, assault rifle in hand. And so as things change, things also do stay the same. And it just depends on either what environment you're in or what things you're trying to change for the world can pull the ugly out of people. And our political climate and our cultural climate has been shifting in dynamic that makes it a little bit more difficult to have those healthy conversations. And especially amongst college campuses, we just got to come together and know that in a few years, we're going to be the change makers. Mm -hmm. So if we can continue to diversify ourselves and learn from each other and communicate effectively when we are in those positions of power or in those, those uh, area, arenas where we can influence change, we now have a calculated educational way to do so. Hmm. Have you seen any ideas that work? I agree with you that communication is part of the problem, especially between councils that we don't see as much communication as is needed on the same college campus. So mm -hmm. what ideas have you seen that actually work to get that communication going? Um, so something that we do at the University of Florida for my undergraduate chapter is that anytime we have something big like Alpha Week, parties, competitions, gosh, or bowls, whatever, we actually send a formal email or actually hand a formal letter to not only the, MP the IFC CPC Multicultural 
uh, council heads and their leadership, but also to each individual president across campus and say, hey, we are officially inviting you to participate in our event. So if you don't participate, it's not that we didn't invite you, it's because you chose not to. For whatever the reason is, you guys can get talked to it, whatever, boom. Um, and so because of that idea, people know that if we give you an invitation, you don't show up, you better not say anything. Because we're gonna show you, hey, big guy, we, we, entered, we invited you, you just didn't want to join. Um, so that's one method you can do, but also that's be reciprocated. On the other end, we've seen a lot more invitations to formal, semi-formal, or uh, football, scholarship bowls, stuff like that from the IFC and CPC, where they want us to have a team. Hey, we want you guys to compete? Awesome, sure. Because you asked, we will provide a team, not a problem. And the money goes to a good cause. So that's one thing. Also, um, putting them in groups and doing you know, workshops. Sometimes it just comes to showing them, hey, let's put you in an environment that we operate in on daily. And when you feel how uncomfortable it is by yourself, you, it kind of opens your eyes a little bit saying, oh my God, I didn't know this is how it was for you. I'm like, yeah, it is. It's a daily thing. It shouldn't be. But we've been put in a situation where we can either kind of cry about it, we can kind of knuckle up and do what we need to do to help our communities to make sure that other minority students don't have to face what we face in the years to come. And so often a lot of awkwardness, often a lot of conversation. But often at the end, there's a lot of growth and a lot of friends that carry across not only the college tenure, but going into adult life. Right. So that network is so important. Oh, my God. I can't tell you how many relationships um, that I've had with people, various councils at the university I went to for undergrad at the University of Buffalo, and just staying in touch with them. And it's opened all kinds of doors probably because I was so involved, right? As president of my own chapter, meeting presidents of other chapters within my council and then outside of my council, those relationships were like gold. So to me, yep. I'm like, why are you not taking advantage of that? They're on your campus. They're walking around and they're going to help you for the next 20, 30, 40 years. You know, so to me, and I never understood why people just kind of you know, we're pre-programmed just to kind of stay within our own chapter. We're pre-programmed to stay within our own council. And it's just like these silos and they don't talk to other people in these other silos. And I'm like, why not? We all have the same problems. We all have the same issues. And if you can break down those barriers and break down those silos, your connections, that's going to enable you to do some amazing things as you graduate and as you move into your career. So the bigger the network. The... All right. Yeah, we're back. <laughs> so, uh, sorry about that. So I know also no you talk about increasing efficiency when working with leadership teams. Um, so I've seen you mm -hmm. work with various types of leadership teams, maybe even on the corporate side as well. Mm -hmm. So what are the key strategies for increasing efficiency when working with leadership teams? Well, from college campuses to, like I said, executive teams for uh, large scale companies, normally what we talk about is communication, communication types. Because often what happens is that in the generation before us, they went through school and some people like you took advantage of all of these different college opportunities, which allowed them to get these soft skills, like how to communicate, how to code your messages, how to show empathy and stuff like that, while others just went to class and went home. And those that without also get leadership roles because they're probably hard workers. And so teaching them, hey, let's go back, let's take a step back and let's work on our communication. Let's evaluate our own department, which you can easily do. Now evaluate yourself. Because you can't help yourself. I mean, if you can't help yourself, you can't help others. Mm -hmm. And so always pushing them to kind of reflect and say, all right, well, we know that you're good in these areas. Where are you bad? Your team is good in these areas. Where are they bad? Now, how can we correlate the weaknesses to maximize our strengths? And so as we talk about those things, it kind of brings, again, just that awareness that, oh, my God, I didn't realize that I could potentially be a problem in our, you know, or the key to our problem. I'm like, yes, you can be. But if you're not willing to consistently grow, and no matter if you're already a doctor for 30, 40 years or not, there's a lot of doctors in the medical field who are great doctors, who have horrible communication skills, horrible leadership skills, and horrible business skills. It's not their fault. They put in all their credits, in a sense, to being a doctor, mm -hmm. which is cool. But now you have to understand to further grow, to be a well-rounded, renaissance kind of doctor, you have to have those other skills, which means you still have to learn and grow from other sources. And so, again, no matter whether it be college or the executive teams, it's about taking time to boost up your skills, kind of like a video game, you know, adding to each little category as you go on. And if you aren't constantly doing that, you're going to be out of whack, out of balance, which is going to cause more problems than solutions in your overall work or day life. 
Right. I love where you're going with that. I compare that many times when I talk about diversity on college campuses and even specifically within the fraternity and sorority community. That's why it's so important to get diverse people in your organization. If we want to win Greek week, for example, we have to have people on our team that have diverse skills, right? We can't have all athletes. If we have all athletes, great, we'll win all the sports competitions. But then when it comes to, you know, the Greek sing, nobody can sing or play an instrument or, you know, so a banner competition, nobody has any artistic ability, um, you know, so you have to be well-rounded if you really want to be the best organization on a college campus, right? So, okay. uh, so that's why diversity is so important. I love that you're taking that approach, and I can certainly see that that would help to increase efficiency when you start having those conversations within leadership teams, whether it be on the corporate side or even in college student organizations. Either way, I can see where that efficiency is now gonna be boosted once you start having those conversations. So that's excellent. Um, all right, so on Fraternity Foodie, you know, I called it Fraternity Foodie because I felt like having food together brings people together. Everybody can agree on a great food item. Um, maybe we have different ideas in terms of politics and things like that, and we can disagree, and that's cool. Uh, but, um, but in terms of food, we all agree, wow, that's a great meal. And it just brings people together, even if they have these different opinions. So what is your particular favorite meal and where can we go to get it? Um, I actually want to share two with you. One is here in Orlando. If you like barbecue, there's this place called Ellie Lou's, um, kind of like a mom and pop barbecue spot, brisket, ribs, all that. But their barbecue sauce and their fries are amazing. I don't know what it's about French fries, but I love them. They're, they're amazing. <laughs> and there's a spot in Pensacola. It's only in Pensacola called Grover's. It's like a little, sh like a, almost like a little shack. And if you want to get food that's going to put you to sleep, that's the place to go. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. All right. And listen, next time I'm in Florida, I'm going to take you up on that. I'm going to be checking those places out. <laughs> yeah, let me know. I definitely will. All right. So where can our audience go to learn more about you, um, your programs? Where can they connect with you if they want to have more conversations? Tell me where they can go to reach you. Uh, they can catch me on Kali, K-A-L-I, Richardson.com or Kali, K-A-L-I, the poet on all social media platforms. And you tell you put me in there, I'll pop right up with a big smile, blue suit probably, and we'll have great conversations. That's excellent. See, I love bringing our listening audience new voices that maybe they haven't heard yet, but they should. And uh, Kali, I think you're a powerhouse. I'll tell you what. And I look forward to seeing you on a stage on a college campus in the very near future. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank All you. Right. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, it's my pleasure. So uh, great. So thank you very much to our audience as well for staying tuned. And hopefully uh, you've enjoyed some of these conversations. We have some great guests that are coming up. So we look forward to seeing you on an upcoming edition of Fraternity Foodie. And bye for now.